Hey, welcome to Jim Bregman Invite You To Seminar. Uh, today's seminar is presented by IJFA referee Rick Salato. And this is entitled Basic Review of Prohibited Acts. My name is Pete Mantel. And with me, as usual, is executive producer Rob Riley. Um, we apologize, but unfortunately, Jim will not be able to join us today. He's, uh, he's in New Mexico visiting his son. Today's presentation is Rick Salato, Basic Review of Prohibited Acts. So this is a two-part in-depth seminar presented by Rick Salato, who is an IJFA referee. Uh, and it's a review of the 30 Shido Prohibited Acts and the 13 Hansokamake Prohibited Acts. This review will concentrate on the more frequently applied prohibited acts. So Sensei Salato is an IJFA referee. He has been a premier referee for many, many decades. I'll pause to let that. He has experience as a leader of the USA Judo and uh, USGA referee committees. Uh, Sensei Salato has a worldwide reputation for conducting outstanding referee education seminars. And this will be one of those excellent seminars. So we're glad that you're all here joining us today. Now, here is Sensei Salato, sir. Thank you very much. Pete. Okay, we're going to uh, uh, start uh, the share, which uh, Ken will be operating the PowerPoint because he, his system is better suited for it, for showing the videos. In the pre, in part one, we, we left off with uh, lift off at 23, Shido number 23. And also, before we even start here, I'd just like to say we have on with us also uh, Mr. Russ Shear, who's the chairman of the U USA Judo Referee Commission. Uh, he will be jumping in from time to time to put his, uh, to add to what I have to say or to modify what I have to say if I'm not on the current book with regard to the latest rule changes, which there shouldn't be any actually, but you know, judo, ref, uh, judo rules seem to change a lot. So let's start with number 20, Shido 24. This is doing a shimewaza with your own or your opponent's belt, the bottom of the jacket or using your fingers. This is somewhat quite rare. The finger thing I've never seen. I've never seen anybody choke someone with their hands like that in a judo match. Uh, someone's microphone is open if you should cut that out. Right, with the with the um, the owner or opponent's belt, it means bringing the cloth of the the belt, the, the belt across the throat across the carotid artery or the airway, or bringing the bottom of the jacket across the throat. Uh, but it also, they did not specifically specify uh, the detail with regard to, if you were to grab your own belt from the side, if, uh, if you as Tori would get on top, to add them in the top of the back of Tori's head and then grab your own belt end, and then use your forehand uh, your forearm or your wrist against the throat and you have the belt in, that's also included. Even though it's, uh, there's debate by some as whether it should be, the IGF doesn't differentiate between whether you're choking them with the, the uh, end of the belt or the bottom of jacket, the skirt part of the jacket across the throat. But if you grab the, the skirt part of the jacket or the belt and the, use your arm to choke, that's still lumped in with that, this penalty. So be aware of that. The next. And here's just some simple diagrams. We'll start with the one on the left side. It's very clear if you see a player stick his arm out like that and grab the bottom of the jacket, and then the second picture, you can't see it, but actually, actually that white left hand goes underneath his blues neck and head and it hands it off to in the middle picture uh right's right hand it, ken if you could be right there it, in that case 
now that is making the choke and the third picture shows that that he's trying to bring the gi up between the chin and the chest to do the choke so very clearly this is what we're talking about in this particular case uh they're using the skirt choke or suso jime and you have the obi jime also is a possibility in these cases next Now here's a infamous match from a world championships a few years back. And this is the Suso Jime. It's illegal. Now notice how she's under the, the neck. She sits back. Now see, if you saw quickly, could you back that up, Ken? where she pulls the, the um, G out of her jacket right at the beginning, slide it back to about uh, one or two seconds in, right? You know, she, she pulls it out of her, of her belt. Now, in and of that, nowadays, that's actually an illegal act also to disarrange right there. She pulled her own jacket out of her belt. That's an illegal act now. You can't disarrange your own judo gi. Uh, but she pulls it out right there. Then if you notice, she her left hand pulled it out. She's going to bring her left hand underneath Blue's head and neck, hand it over to her right hand right there. And then once she's got a grip on it with her right hand, she sits up and puts... The, the, the French player into this vice type grip where both legs are pressing and she's pulling back and uh, chokes her right out. This is uh, okay. Now the thing right here, you can see freeze the gi. She has the end of the gi. She is as long as she's underneath the chin then it's valid if it's, in this case, it's definitely the judo, the jacket that's across the throat and not the arm, but it, it wouldn't matter in either case. So this is a very, uh, this is a choke that is illegal. And the problem is uh, you have to be a very good referee to see something like this. You have to be in the right position and uh, enough distance away to see that if it makes this point here, to make it illegal. If it is, then you're supposed to call mate and then stand them up and then give shido to white for this uh, illegal act. Okay, next please. And as mentioned, if any of you have um, any questions, go to the chat and write the question there. If it's a convoluted question or a complex question, then um, one of the Peter, Pete or Rob will unmute you and you can ask the question. Hey, uh, okay. Rick, Ralph, Ralph had a question to say, would you stop the action when the gi is pulled out and call the penalty? No, no. In this case, you, you would, uh, because it, it was going at, at this time. Uh, see, that's a difficult rush. What would you do? <laughs> what did that about? Who, me? Uh, I, I'd wait until the, uh, the, the, the gi was underneath, so not just uh, the, okay. the pulling out as far as that penalty goes. All right, same. I, too, that's how I would feel that. I'd wait to see. If she pulled it out, then you know there's a reason for it, and she's going to go with the choking thing. And as soon as that illegal choke goes in, then you call it and give the penalty for that. I hope that answers your question, Ralph. Uh, number 25, overstretch, uh, overstretch of the leg in a shima, shima or kitsetsuwaza. This is a new penalty that has been introduced within the last four or five years, uh, four, three or four years, actually. Um, now I can't really remember seeing much of it in the earlier days, but I'm seeing a lot of it now. And uh, so let's go next slide, please. This is... Uh, 25. This is just a diagram to outline things here. This is the end, end up position. 
You notice White has some type of choking action, um, and, and he's got the leg across. He's he's got the Blues right leg completely trapped, and he's, he's stretching it. Next, please. Next slide will show basically a demarcation of where the uh, knee is. And if anything is above the knee, from the knee up to the hip, if that uh, can, if you put your arrow on the white's arm that's gripping the blue's leg, if that arm were down exactly on the knee, on the yellow line, or on the green side, uh, anywhere there, then that you wouldn't, you would allow that shimewaza to continue. But if the arm is where it is now or anything above, like at the upper calf part or, or, at, on that blue arrow, or sorry, the red arrow, if anywhere along there, if that arm, that securing, white securing arm is anywhere on that part of the leg, pulling the leg in to control the player, you're, you're causing hyperextension of the knee. And this is, they consider an illegal act. Uh, it's not a big illegal act, but they'll call mate and, and shido is the appropriate response here. Because it isn't quite a knee lock. It's, it's, it's not like doing concetso to the knee, uh, but it's close to it. So they're, they're only going to give a shido in this case. So I hope everybody, everybody understands this. Those who have been around for a while understand this is the basic look uh, of, of a situation that you would call this a penalty is if the leg is stretched during the application of a shimewaza. In most instances, a shimewaza. Sometimes it can be kensetsuwaza. Uh, okay, next, please. Hey, uh, Rick, I think uh, there's a question here from Tom. Back, back it up. Okay, uh, go ahead. My question is, how would you sign that for a, for a shito? Uh, I don't say, know. Yeah, Just I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if there's a standardized gesture for that because it is new. Uh, Russ, do you? Uh, uh, you I don't know of this uh, of a standardized gesture for it either. Yeah, I just announced it. Uh, you know, being in the United States, you could you're not supposed to talk to the players technically, but you could overstretching the leg. Uh, and and I'm sure someone will come up with some type of gesture that everybody can accept eventually, but because it's only been in the uh, a, a judo prohibited act for the last only three or four years, they have not come up with uh, a, a universal ge generic gesture for that action. So you either make one up, but, you know, that's logical, or just tell the player you overstretched the leg and uh, then give them the penalty. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I can't give you. A, I wish there. You know, it could say, "Well, this is it." Some of them have set gestures. Some of them do not. Okay. Nick. Uh, Ken, and continue. Wait. And I'm. I'm sorry, Rick. Uh, excuse me one more time. Mickey Takamori has a question. Hi, Mickey. Hello, everyone. It's great to see that your face is out there. Um, just a quick, quick. Uh, thing I want to say is that just for those that are inexperienced referees, just to go through the procedure, you see the um, the leg lock, uh, what you call, and you know the, just the general procedure. It's just a suggestion. Thank you. I can if we could continue now. Now here's a case where the white player will jump on top. And actually, if you really watch closely, this is illegal. Initially, let's run through it again. And if you can notice, when white comes up top, when she actually applies it initially, she's at the knee. Oh, can you back that up, Ken, please? No, it doesn't want to stay there. All right, if you watch, White jumps up top and he she's at the knee, but immediately after she goes to the, the calf and then she slides up even higher, 
and this is definitely a leg stretch. Too, that's too much, too much pain. Mate and Cheeto. Okay, let's uh, next, please. I hope everybody sees that because they're really picking on it. They don't want a player uh, hurt by this action. Here's another one. Player White gets on top, grabs the leg, kicks the player over. She's at the, the lower calf, so it's illegal. She's below the knee when when the grip goes on. And she's, she's not down holding the ankle, but she is right on the upper part of the calf, and that's stretching the knee also. So please call that. Next. Okay, this time, very interesting. Notice White is right at the knee. He's not above it. He's not below it. And he's putting the choke in. In this case, unfortunately, the referee misses the choke and the players passed out because that choke was on for quite some time. So in this case, you do not penalize, you allow White to do, continue the choke. Because in fact, the blue player in here, you could see him tapping you know, like almost four seconds ago. And the referee was smart enough to be able to see it and call it. So in this situation, because White grips the knee at the knee, so that there's no tension on the knee, there's no hyperextension of the knee, this is a valid action and it should be allowed to continue. Next, please. Uh, excuse me, Rick. Uh, Rocky's yes. asking if it starts at the knee and stops quick when it moves, is it still a Shido? Say that. I, I don't know what that last part means. If it, if uh, it starts at the knee and does Can you what? clarify? Can you, can you unmute and clarify that question, Rocky? They're saying it looked like it was a fast move. So if it starts at the knee and stops quick when it moves, is it still a Shido? It looked like one was a fast move. I apologize. I don't know what that means. I will tell you, in that case, you allow it to continue because he went right to the knee. Now, in some case, in the first case we saw, the girl had the knee, and then as she rolled through, her, her, her blocking arm moved up or moved down the leg from the knee to the upper calf, almost to the mid calf, and that makes it illegal during the action. So in this case, we, um, it, you just let the action continue if they're at the knee, and they don't go anywhere else. They don't go up during the while they're playing the choke. If they do move it from that position up, or, or I should say down to the ankle, then you, you do call Mate and give the Shido. Now, penalty 26 is bear hug. This is very interesting. This is um, kind of new. It's a 10, 10, 12 years old. Uh, again, and the rules changed. When it first came out, it was very convoluted. Uh, you know, we, you know, we thought you could, if you did a bear hug from any direction, it was a bear hug. So people were saying Uranagi was a bear hug. Uh, some people were saying Tuaragaishi, the counter for uh, Marote Gary was a bear hug because you're bear hugging from behind and so forth. But over the last six to eight to 10 years, it's been a little more refined. And the first rule for bear hug is that it is only can be an illegal bear hug and that's the other thing you have to understand. There are bear hugs that are legal, and, and then there are bear hugs that are illegal. And again, the penalty, all the penalty, it's a Shido penalty. Unless you hurt someone, then you, you talk to your judges and your mat chief to decide whether to move it up. But that's another whole clinic. Um, in this case, only attacks, bear hug attacks from the front are illegal. But but what's important is there are a couple other um, criteria for an illegal bear hug to be called. One is that Tori has no, no pre-grip. And what grip means is grabbing the judo gi. So touching the judo gi is not a grip and holding the player's wrist 
is not a grip. But if the Tory has a grip and then goes in to the back, that's okay. That's legal. If the player has a wrist grip and then make and reaches in with the other hand, and as that arm is going in, he lets go of the wrist and goes in with the other one. When both hands are coming in simultaneously, or what the IGF now is calling consecutively, because the word simultaneously means at the same time, both hands coming at the same time. Consecutively means one hand might start early, but the other hand is going in also, but after, and they both end up going to the back. In that case, if both hands are going even at separate times, but they're almost arriving somewhat at the same time, that's also considered simultaneously or consecutively. Uh, uh, this, in this case, if they're holding the wrist or hand and they, they go in, that's illegal. But if they have a normal grip, some kind of grip, and then the Tory goes in, <clears throat> uh, then it's okay. You let the bear hug go. Now, what's interesting too, which we, we don't mention, is if the Tory has a grip, I mean, the Uke has a grip, that doesn't matter. Uh, so if Uke comes in with both hands and grabs, it's illegal because Tori could have a grip. If the big thing here they're trying to stress is that it isn't a, a football tackle where you're coming in with no grip, just both hands are coming out and, and grabbing around the player. So it's urgent, it's very important you understand that. Okay, the next criteria is that both hands and arms attack simultaneously as image at the same time or consecutively, where one comes in and the other one comes in immediately after. Now that's very different from if one hand goes to the back of the player and grips, like they're doing in Ouchi Gary, and maybe the, the, uh, the, the one hand grabs the belt or the back, and as you're dropping down, your other hand lets go of the sleeve and you embrace him, you're like a Daki Ouchi Gary or an embracing Ouchi Gary, uh, like a bear hug. In that case, once this hand has reached its point and locked into place, and this other hand comes in after that, that's not a bear hug. Uh, you know, it could look like a bear hug, but it's not an illegal bear hug. So be aware of that. It's, there's a, there's not much. If, if you have, you know you have experience, you'll know the difference between those two. So both hands attack simultaneously or consecutively. And the other issue is that they both reach the back, some part of the back, and the, the, your hands can grip like around the waist with the arms up and, and the guy can just grab the waist. You can entrap both arms and the waist. You can be over the top of the shoulder either way. Any kind, it doesn't matter which way you grab them from the front. If you go around and both of your hands are touching your back and you did it without any, there's no pre-grip, then and, and the arms come in simultaneously, then that's an illegal bear hook. Next. And the ukes much must reach the ukes back. I'm seeing cases where players <clears throat> they go in for the bear hug, but what you see is one hand goes to the back and the other hand goes to the back of the bicep and all they have a bear hug with they have the start of a bear hug with one hand but the other hand's not on the back it's on the back of the arm but that's not a bear hug okay so be aware of that keep your eyes open for things like that okay next slide please and here uh, we'll skip this because it's confusing uh, next slide please and these are interesting the basically it's just showing some this is just a few of the grips that that are bear hug they could be valid or invalid it all depends if all the criteria the from the front no pre-grip simultaneous or consecutively entering hands and both hands reach the back if one hand as i mentioned like in the top three that if one hand goes in first and locks then the second hand goes in afterwards then in that case, that's allowed because the hands are going individually. Okay, next. Now this is a kind of a complex situation. 
And I'll let this play again so you can see what's happening. This is not easy because what happens is you have blue grabs with one hand and the other. But when blue is on his knees, blue drops to the ground, he stands up. And then he does, if you notice quickly, uh, if you notice, blue does a bear hug. He's not gripping. A Tory may be gripping, but blue's not gripping right here. There, he, he's grabbing from the front. Keep going. Both hands come in. It's okay, it's illegal. Now, the question here is you do not, because white's still balanced, you must give white the opportunity to counter this action. He's so bad, he's balanced enough where he can try to counter him. He could throw him for a full point. But in this case, he tries to spin him over. Blue jumps out, forts the attack, and he lands to his front, and there's no score. In this case, you would you would call after let white do, do his thing, his counter. It doesn't work. Then because they're both out, also, you just say, Mate, could you freeze this? You're gonna have to hit the arrow. All right. In in this case. Uh, you white give white the opportunity to attack, do the counter. If it doesn't work, if it scores in a pawn, then you don't need to give the penalty to blue. That's like redundant. It's moot. It doesn't matter because white won by a full point. If white were to counter that illegal action by a a wazar, he gets a wazari for that throw or no score, as in this case. According to the rules, it's written in the 2020 rules that once you give the penalty or no penalty, that blue, because he did do the illegal act, still should get the penalty when they stand up and go to their marks. So you do give this bear hug uh, illegal act a shido. If it were a wazari, if the kaishi was a, uh, the counting by white was a wazari or no score. Okay, I hope everybody understands that. Okay, next, please. Thank you. Okay. Number 27 is we have the leg scissors to the trunk, which is also known as dojime, or head or neck. This has been in the rules since the Kodakon wrote the rules. So this has been there for a long time. Uh, one thing is, as you grow up in refereeing, you know, you learn that if you can scissors the trunk, you can put your legs around a player's waist and cross your ankles to keep them there, to maneuver him, to control him. That's not illegal. The illegal act is the squeezing of the trunk, the squeezing of the head or neck, the crushing, you know, causing pain or watching the player as he's trying to squeeze him. That's the illegal act. So you want to be. So that's the illegal act. All right. um, now, uh, 27 leg scissors. I, I'm sorry we don't have any videos on that or any pictures. All right, 28, illegal act uh, Shido 28, is to kick with the knee or foot to break a grip or to kick the opponent's leg or ankle without a throw. That's two different things. Now, if you would remember, let me look back in, in the first part of this track. In October, uh, Article 15, uh, uh, Shido 15 was to break the grip with the knee or leg. And that on that one, we covered the one where you put your player has a strong wrist grip and you make your hand a fist and you put your own fist behind your own knee and kick your leg back to try to tear that grip away. That's an illegal act. This is the other one, the more, the more uh, old timey one. If the Japanese word is kote tataki, uh, and it is very rare. You don't see it anymore. And basically, what what happens is the white player here, the blue, has a very strong wrist grip of some type, and white brings his knee up on top of the the uh, wrist and hand, and either presses it off with the knee, or brings it up and swings it and strikes it off or kicks it off with the knee. 
Now, uh, there's been differences of opinion in the early days as to, you know, one, you know, we were told in the early day, oh, if you press it off, it's okay. If you kick it, you strike it, that's illegal. But today, the IGF interpretation on this is in either case, if a player were to bring his knee up like this and try to break a grip, that it is mate and shido, it's illegal. So, and again, like I said, if you see one of these, good, mark that up as a monumentous occasion because it's very, very rare to see these. I haven't seen one in years uh, because most of the players know it's no longer allowed. You can't do it. You couldn't do it back in the old days. So, very, they did it um, when, when in the Japanese judo, uh, when there were no weights, the, the little guys would try to break the grip of the bigger guys off by using this technique. Okay, next. I think we have a video of this actually. If you watch Blue's knee, very quick. Notice how White shakes his hand. He got it stunned. And we'll watch it one more time in slow motion because it was so quick. See his Blue's knee, right knee come up. He puts it on White and kicks right through and breaks the grip off. That's Mate and Cheeto. Okay. And again, I said, very rarely, uh, you'll, I don't want to say it because what happens the next tournament you go, you'll see it. But uh, it, at local and regional tournaments, you, you, know, you won't see something like this. Um, this is like a high level thing. And most of the players now know that it, you can't do it. It's not allowed. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, this is relatively new. This, I mean, for lots of years, 50 plus years, you were able to do Shime Kinsetsu in the Tachi Shise, which is the standing position. Some of you know that as Tachi was. But as I mentioned in the previous clinic and those previously, Tachi Waza means standing technique, but Tachi Shise is standing position. That's what we should be saying when we're talking about two players standing and holding each other. They're in tachi shise. They're not in tachi waza. If they're doing a sort of gar, you say that guy's doing a tachi waza, but it's not tachi waza. Uh, any, in any event here, so this, to apply the shime or kinsetsu in the standing position is no longer allowed. Uh, the referees to call mate and then give them shido. So let's move on. Next. And here's a case. White applies a Tobi Juji or a jumping Juji Katane. That's immediately, as soon as she jumps up, it's Mate. And she hasn't hurt the player. So at, if the player does a standing technique and brings the player down and hurts the opponent, the Uke, now you're looking at a more severe penalty. In this case, she hasn't hurt him at this point. So you, could, you call Mate and then get them up and put them on their marks and give them the penalty. Everybody understand that, I hope. Okay, um, next. All right, here's another thing. This is a, a Tomoe Nage with a Juje right away. And the IGF is, considers this illegal, it, that it's being applied from the standing position. There's some debate on this. Some people are saying the player, the, you know, the, the white went to the ground. Then he applied the technique when he was on the ground. So, but the IGF is saying this is illegal. Must be caught. Now he heard him here. Uh, that's not good. So if, if a good ref, if you'd call Monte late in this case, you'd get a lot of comments from the evaluators that you weren't fast enough to call Monte. They should have been stopped right away. The problem is you got to remember these, these videos may be from tournaments from years ago, a couple of years ago. All right, so this is illegal. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, Rick, I'm sorry. Uh, do we wait until all motion stops or allow UK to counter? That's from Ralph. Uh, there, no, there is no counter here. As soon as what happens here, as soon as I see him go down, Mate, right there. Stop.
And that arm lock hopefully would not have happened if you call Mate right in this right place. All right, next, please. Now, the, the, some of you may be aware of the throw called Uregaishi, and some call it Uregaishi Nage. And basically, this is picture one. You grab the arm, you twist underneath it. You, in picture three, you fold your back, and then you roll the guy over using an arm lock. Interestingly, just to give you a historical perspective, we've been doing this throw for you know 80 years. It's not a technically, it's not a throw though. It never has been. The the rule was even back years ago, 50 years ago, um, that you cannot throw someone with, with an arm lock throw. And this is an arm lock throw. This is more better described as a uh, hikomi gaishi or a takedown technique. You cannot score with this. You couldn't score 50 years ago, even though people scored with it. If, if you went up high enough to the guy that knew the rules, they'd say, no, you can't score from this. Never could you could score from this, yet referees were giving scores to this. You cannot score using an arm lock. And now, especially since this arm lock throw is being done from the standing position it's elite, it's mate and chido and you want to call that mate as fast as possible so the, the tori lets the arm go and doesn't hurt the arm okay next slide and here is it actually being employed at the 2019 world uh, grand slam in osaka and ooh, wasari <laughs> Not good. This is, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Let's see it one more time. Notice he wraps the blues armor on his own arm and then he dives underneath and he twists it. Now, usually you pull him over in this case. It's interesting that, well, now he's spinning, but. He didn't have any Kazushi on this, so he's going backwards with it. And I would say even 50, 40, 30, 20 years ago, this was just a takedown. You cannot score that. Or you couldn't score it. Now you can, absolutely can't score it because it's you're doing an arm lock throw from the standing position. Okay, next. Uh, okay, the last Cheeto penalty is to entangle the leg without making an immediate attack. And this is where a player will uh, sit, uh, you know, better player usually. You don't do this unless you're very, very good. But your player will do an Uchigari and just hook the leg in and just keep it there like as a lure so the player reacts to it. And then the player comes and does Uchimata to finish him off or whatever. Uh, it could be Ochi or Koichi or similar fashion. We have one of our uh, Olympic medalists, silver medalists, who has the infamous or famous sticky foot, where he puts the instep of his foot on the back of the knee to get the player to react to it. And when they do, he'll come in and finish them off. I'm not saying it's, and the IGF is not saying, it's not illegal to do these lures, to, to go in and stall and make it look like the, players failed so the other player was try to counter it or do something um but again then you take into effect the five minute the five second rule the uh, attack must be immediate so if you stick it in there and uh you know to see if the lure works you allow the player to make the move but once it gets to past five seconds then it's into negative judo territory and you you penalize the player Okay, I hope everybody understands that this is this is not very common, but it's it's pretty common at the higher level tournaments. So be aware of it. All right, now we're going to move on to the next slide, please. And these are just some pictures of these uh, different types of uh, lower locks where they just put the leg in there and wait to see how the uke reacts and then it, it, it finishes them off. You have to be a very good player to be able to do this, especially at the high level judo. 
So um, new, new people, uh, like uh, it's not something for the novice. Next slide, please. All right, now we move into the, the direct on Sukumake penalties, serious infringements. Uh, generally, most of these are those that would cause serious injury, acts that are unsportsmanship, like that show unsportsmanship like conduct or are against the spirit of judo. And let's move to the next slide, please. There are two ways to get the Hansukumake, which most of you know. A cumulative Hansukumake is, is getting like three shidos. You get you know, a shido for a minor violation, another one with, with another minor violation. But when you do the third shido, that's Hansukumake and you lose the match. Uh, the other form of Hansukumake is the direct Hansukumake, which are the ones that we're going to discuss now. And in any case that you give direct Hansukumake, you must consult the judges and the match chief. And if you do not have match chiefs, then the chief referee or supervisor should be involved with this decision. Now, in the past, we had a rule uh, that it was the majority of three rules to give a direct on Sokomake. Now it seems at the IGF level, and I believe at the national level, if Russ will chime in, that all three of the officials, the, the three, the referee and the two judges, and the MAC chief, who is the senior most referee watching that MAC, must be in concurrence, agree, in order to give a direct on Sokomake. Russ, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So the, everybody must be in agreement to give that penalty. Now, let me say, though, that uh, we, we always say, uh, well, the, the MAT supervisor's opinion is, is, a, is an opinion. But in most instances, if the MAT supervisor tells you it's a penalty, it's a penalty, and you, and you go along. Um, because they have more experience than those that the other people that are working on the map. All right, let's move to the next, please. Okay. All right, the first Hatsukomake is the head dive. Uh, head diving it doesn't as occur as much as it did, but it still does, and it, it, it's, it's very dangerous. And, and the head diving and head defense are somewhat similar because they will possibly injure the, the cervical vertebrae or the, the neck bones, the, the bones in the back of the spine at the neck level. And the, you know, the spinal cord is inside there. Uh, the, an injury to that part of the neck is, it can be catastrophic to the uh, athlete who's injured in that kind of thing. So the, the offending competitor can continue in the next contest. If it's done and they are penalized, they can continue in the next contest, there are two of these penalties we have now um, that you can continue, and the IGF puts these the first two. Okay, next slide, please. Now, let's look, analyze, and look into the head diving zone, or what the head diving we're talking about is. <clears throat> what you do is, in your mind, this is how I look at it. Um, to make it easier for newer referees and even senior referees. When, a, let's say White's doing that with Chimata, what you do is you drop the yellow line, you drop like a, imagine dropping a, a plumb bob a weight, a line right there, the drop line, draw it from the side of his hip, his right side of his hip, down to the tatami. And then on the other side, all right, that yellow line indicates that side of White's hip. On the other side, the left hip, drop line is straight down to the floor. And you notice the grid on the bottom is two, those two lines with the red arrows. If the head, which is circled in red, hits between those two lines, then that's a head dive. It doesn't matter whether the head is hyperextended or, or hyperflexed or it's turned sideways or lateral, I mean, it's adducted to the to the shoulder, it's brought down to the shoulder, or it's rotated to the side. I always hear people, higher level people, explain when is a dive not a dive? Well, and the response was that I hear is sometimes 
uh, oh, when if if the uh, Tory turns his head, it's okay. That's not true. You could turn your head all different ways here. If that head, no matter how you turn your head, if it if it touches the ground between those two red lines, those two red arrowed lines, and it's underneath Uke's or Tory's hips, that's illegal. And and I'll tell you, talking to uh, orthopedic surgeons, that if if the head goes in in a normal fashion, it, that's the strongest position. If you were to hyperflex forward and it hit here, that's worst position to be in. And if you were to twist the head and land in a in an abnormal type of position, that makes the neck easier to break than if it's just going straight in. So please be very careful. Now, why all this intricacy is because what we're trying to get across to you is that if the Tory dives into his head and he has all his weight on top of the head coming down straight into his neck, that's a lot of weight coming down. If the head is outside those two right red lines, then that mitigates it. It lessens the amount of direct the vector force coming down into his neck, and therefore it reduces the chance of injury. That's why if that head were to go off to the side, and and uh, that you generally wouldn't call that a dive. It's when the head goes between those two yellow lines and hits the mat. And actually, if you've been around, it doesn't even have to hit the mat. If, it, if, if the head, head skims over the mat, maybe just his hair touches, but he goes over it and he's put his head in a, in a dangerous position, that's also diving because we don't want anyone to do this because in the U.S., over a 10-year period, about 10 years ago, four of our athletes had their necks fractured and caused catastrophic damage. And I think, uh, I know two of them passed away because of being in that situation. I don't know about the other two, but we don't want to see this anymore. So that's the reason why you, uh, if you dive in the head into that dive zone, that's why it's dangerous. And what's even worse is in some instances, you put Tori coming down with his weight. Sometimes Tori has Uke on top of him, and he's carrying his weight down on his head. Oh, I, 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 if I'm at the, I always cringe when I see stuff like that. Very dangerous. We cannot allow this to happen. And it's up to you uh, to uh, to clarify that. Could you uh, unmute uh, Mr. Narimatsu, please? Sure. Hi. Hi, Rick. Hey, um, hey Kay, how you doing? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me on. Um, I've been re running a couple of mini referee clinics at my dojo. And one of the key questions about this head dive, I say, no matter what it looks like, if it looks like a head dive or a, a bridge, you call it uh, uh, as a penalty. The, uh, the One of the questions that came up is, uh, if you, you'll see this at the uh, Olympic level and world championship level at the high level tournaments, and they're allowing it now from what, uh, from what they're saying to me. Uh, what uh, in the US now, I believe that it is uh, against the rules, no matter what, is that correct? That is my understanding. Russ, do you have any, would you clarify that, that if you can? Uh, yeah, as, as described in the, in this photo and, and what you've said, that would definitely be a penalty. Uh, the only other thing that I would add to that is that uh, an additional uh, piece of information that will, will help you determine whether that head is coming down in that area is it's in general, it, it's going to require a uh, not not a head turn, but a shoulder twist. So if they come over the shoulder, rather than hit, even if the side of the head hits, but if they're co coming over the shoulder, then that would be uh, would not be a penalty. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, for those that don't, Mr. K, not, Dr. Narimatsu, what is a IGFA referee, and he's been around for quite a while. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in this case, we have Tori's head is 
inside, even if any part now the, the you might be getting conflicting information because there's some people that are as as uh Dr. Marim not Naramatsu mentioned is that uh they they may be getting easier in the application of this but if you the the head referee for the chief referee of the uh, European Judo Union is of the opinion and he, uh, and he's a member of the IGF referee commission that they want this applied uh severely they they don't want anybody to be hurt by this so please, if the head hits believe, between those two yellow lines, and you know you can't call it now. It's like I showed this picture at a clinic, and you know, some of the people said, "Well, I can't call it now because you don't know the head is not hitting the ground." So you have to wait. It's just I haven't found a good one where the head hits the ground. Um, you know that's a video. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Now in this case, you notice that whites hip is or head is inside even though some of the head may be out of it some of the head is in it and with tori straight over the top of it okay's coming in uh, tori's coming in over his neck the blue is coming down also this is severely dangerous for the neck so this is uh, hunter gomate next slide please oh next and actually the left hip drop line you don't need because it's the right one that took because the head's so far over to that side but any part of the head that hits now here's a case of a throw being done notice how blue has turned his body his shoulder and his entire body and if you draw the two yellow drop lines down his head is way outside so most of the impact that vector force of impact will be um on the outside and most of the force will be on blue white's uh, left shoulder and all of the side of blue therefore this is fine this is okay now what the other the question i just saw the question about does the head have to touch and as i mentioned a, a bit earlier a few minutes ago that no the head does not have to touch uh you, if you do a a, a, a dive and the head just just goes past like goes under the hips and and the and the back actually hits as if those head if that head goes underneath the hips that's too close to allow to occur because at any point the uke could brace up against it and do a hip check and and force that head down and break that player's neck so we don't want that um to happen so the head does not have to touch if it passes over that head drop zone, the head dive zone, the red line area, then then that also is illegal, unless they've eased up on it lately, which is would is, would be very scary. As far as our local and regional judo is concerned, and even national, you need to be uh, safe. Remember, number one principle in all refereeing is safety of the players, and this is one of the places we do that. To make sure these kind of dangerous techniques are not not allowed to happen. Okay, next, please. Can you uh, yeah, see if that works? All oh, right, doesn't work. Too bad. This one, uh, too bad, because this was a good, very clear dive. Next slide. Uh, this is a, can be watch this closely going to play it a couple of times whoops uh, now this is for me you might not think so but this is kind of a complex issue because several things are happening you have blue, blue doesn't attack and causes white to step outside. But then white doesn't attack right away. And there's some people are saying, well, because white didn't attack, it's not a continuous action. And then for, therefore white started to throw outside. So it's not valid and Monte should be called. But 
White did continue to throw. The referee never said Mate and ends up doing this quite dangerous action. What are you going to do? Well, first of all, I don't think the IGF, the, the, in this case, the IGF felt, uh, or the, at least the supervisors, I could see the uh, guy on the, uh, that's watching, that one of the supervisors uh, did see the dive, and he signals to the other guy, and they review the video. Let's play it again. Because very clearly, this is a very dangerous action. Notice how blue comes in with some kind of, and white comes in fast enough. That, that should be good enough for it to count it as continuous action. So therefore, this, this should not be allowed to happen and Mate should be called. She dove right underneath. Mate, consult your judges. And um, in this case, how you consult your judges is if your judges are on the ball, they'll see it's a dive and know you have to be consulted. So the judges will say, uh, you know, that one will ask the other, do you think it was a dive? Absolutely. Then Han Sokomaki for white. Then you call the referee up and tell them on your radio. Instead of the refereeing have to call Mate and then walk over to you guys sitting at the table and say, what, what are we going to do here? Or the referee calling into the table, which they don't like. You're not supposed to do that. So um, in this case, the good team of referees, the judges will agree. Now, if you're in the right setup, the supervisor or the mat chief is right next to those guys, and he could put his two cents in too. So the referee has the confidence that the other three all agree this definitely was a dive and he can give it. So there was a conference. It's done. Good. Okay, I hope everybody understands how the protocol should go, is the judges should be right on the ball. And, and remember, in cases like this, involve the mat chief or the senior referee if you're on a, in a tournament where you have mat chiefs. If you don't, then you're going to have to rely on the three officials on the mat, and hopefully the chief referee caught a, a glimpse of it. If you have the care system, then you, and if there's any doubt then the chief referee should get a chance to look at that uh, before decisions made. But in that case, I think I hopefully it's very clear for everybody that that is Hansukomante. Next, All right, here's another example. Boom! A little karate, a little uh, kick to the face. That's okay though. Yeah wasn't on purpose. Blue comes in, he right, right over the top, Hansel Gomaki. Very dangerous. Do not allow this to occur. Right, his head goes right under his own hips. All that weight's coming down on him. We do not want to see any accidents, so please call Mate and Penalizing. And and uh, again, please understand these when when I say this is Hans Hockum Wanke Blue, that's not me saying it, it's the IGF saying it. These these videos were all used in their um, January clinics for the last couple of years, and this was the response they wanted. This is Hans Hockum Wanke Blue, no question. Call it. All right, next. All right, this is an interesting one because he, he doesn't complete the arc, but he does drive his head into the mat between his own hips. Very, very dangerous. Broken neck right there. Look at it, all that weight coming down. Whoa, just cringe, cringe. Very, very dangerous. Matsukomaki blue. Definitely. No question. Hands down. Very, very dangerous. Next. All right. Now, I, I, I put this in here because actually 
pure bridging out of a throw is not a penalty. It's not a prohibited act. What they've done is when they first started penalizing bridges, they lumped it all together and it was an illegal act. But at the last few years, what they've done is that if a player does a bridge out of a throw, if the Tory goes in for the throw and they uke bridges on his head and his feet with his neck bridge hyper extended backwards and his back arches, and he remains with his back to the ground, in other words, he stays in a back bridge position. What the referee is supposed to do is consider that that the players landed on their back and call the pawn and the match is over. So it's not a penalty. It's treated like a, a full point, this bridge, full bridge. So I hope every, everybody knows that. If you've been refereeing, you know that's the case. Uh, so the big thing here, what's the difference between a bridge and a head defense is that in a bridge, which is you give a pawn for, the back of the uke remains facing down, even though it may not be touching the mat. The other thing you should be very careful with is that it doesn't mean just the head touches. In some instances, if the head hits and some of the shoulder hits, it still has implications for injury to the, the neck. And so you have to be very careful. And now we have a problem because you have some referees, uh, higher level referees that will tell you, oh, no, if it hits the head and shoulder, that's okay. And you have others, oh, no, just, just the head hit. And then you have the more the safer referee seeing the head and the head and shoulder. If either of those two hit, then that's illegal and dangerous. And as I understand it, the, the latest clinic uh, says that if it's head or head and shoulder bridge, that's illegal. If it's dangerous to the neck, we don't, it's the IGF doesn't want to see any of the athletes injured in this manner. Okay, next slide, please. The next situation is different from bridging, even though very similar. Uh, the IGF calls this a head defense, and this is the number two Hansako Marke. So diving is number one, and head defense is number two. And this in the US, some people refer to it as a head post. You might hear of an arm post where you stick your arm out and do like a cartwheel around your arm so you don't land. Uh, it, uh, those are okay. They're dang they can be dangerous and injure the arm, but in most cases they don't, but they haven't done anything about that rule. On this head defense they have, if a player being thrown puts his head out and then tries to spin to their front, and they might only get to their side when they spin, but if there's any kind of head hitting, okay, head hitting, and now he's going over, he spins his body so he's face down, then that is the head defense, and this is the illegal Hansoko, direct Hansoko Maki, a prohibited act, and you give them Hansoko Maki penalty. Okay, uh, next slide, please. This prohibit, prohibited act, act is designed to punish those to use such a dangerous action that may severely injure the cervical vertebrae and spinal cord. It is also designed to discourage the younger players from imitating players from doing those kind of escapes. Um, we, we want to discourage this. I know in your heart, you see it. It's beautiful to see these kind of escapes, but they are very, very dangerous. And we cannot as referees allow, and coaches, you should not be allowing these kind of actions or teaching anything like this. Please keep the players away from these type of very dangerous actions. Okay, here we have it. Uh, first example. Notice white does a head bridge and spins. White gets pushed out, but he comes back and that's no problem because he comes back right away. We discussed that in part one. And watch, white head goes in, he spins to his front. That's Mate and Hosogamake. This, uh, unfortunately, this referee call this a score. That, that's not the correct way to handle this. This is a die. That's a head defense. Same. Let's watch this. Oh, sound.
Oh, Blue spun. He put his head down. Very dangerous. And Sokomake. Next. Yeah. Okay, here's another uh, side he, he, he get he's thrown. White puts his head down. Now notice one rule, let me one thing you should be looking for if you can, if your eyes are fast enough, is notice when someone is thrown in judo, when they do, they're supposed to be doing ukeme, notice he's, he hyperextends his head. He's not tucking his chin in. When you do ukeme, you tuck your, you're told to tuck your chin in when you do break falls. Because he's tucked the extended the head out, his intention is to do a head bridge or a head uh, post. Then he spins and possible broken neck. We don't want that. Therefore, mate and consult your judges and the tech, the uh, mat chief. Um, get them, get all their opinions. Now, as far as intentional or unintentional, uh, there, there actually is no difference. If you do it, you've did it. It's like, uh, what's the, um, Ignorance of the law doesn't matter if you don't know it. If you don't. The other thing too, let me just my own point of view is generally you will hear people say someone did the action with intent. Well, let me. The the thing is, who in a judo contest who knows that a cheetos too many cheetos will make them lose. Ansoko Make will make them lose. Will do an illegal act on purpose. It's illogical. So in most instances, if in, in one of these severe Hatsugomake um, type penalties are done uh, there, it may be just as a reaction to the action, like what they call muscle memory kind of reaction, a quick reaction. Uh, unfortunately, it is an illegal act. It's not allowed. And they still have to be penalized for the action because it is very dangerous. So as far as what is in, I'll tell you the only time intent comes into play for me anyways is when someone actually hauls off and punches someone or spits at them or swears at them that's intentional you know maybe their reasoning has gone past they're not going to win the match now because they're going to get penalized out okay so so in this case it's mate and hansugomaki for white for that head defense spin and again there is no in most of these there's no uh, uh with intent or without intent it's if it's done it's illegal um, you will um there is and has been covered in previous clinics that if the head of the uke is trapped like in koshigaruma or the chest is brought down tight on top of the uh, tori and he he throws the player and there's what um what is the word um it's it's like Tory caused. Then in those cases, it is possible not to give the dive uh, the the head defense penalty. But that's something you need to discuss with your team. Now, the next those were the first two prohibited acts. Hachigomake. All right. I just the question I see on the screen is as far as what is the gesture for head dive. Now there were several, but uh, Russ, you uh, chime in or any, if there's another A ref, referee online, which I haven't seen the list, that's uh, you know, in the mix now. The, 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 if, if there's a dive, I've seen people like tap their head, like don't tap your head, it's, you know, you'll mess your hair up as a referee, but, but go like, like head and then they point to the ground, head dive. Some people, you know, if you, you were to stand on one leg and like throw your head into the ground, that looks silly for a referee. But this is a little more uh, professional looking. Head dive, point down to the ground. Uh, the other thing, you know, I they used to show people doing like a like a 
bridging action. That was a bridge, but I understand this has fallen to the wayside. No, very, very few, if anybody does this anymore. Most of it's head dive. Uh, Russ, have you seen any gesture that's accepted? Or is there a universal IGF gesture? I, 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 the only thing I've seen is uh, like a, a flat hand on the upper part of the forehead uh, and indicating that uh, as a head dive as well. Okay, so that's a more uh, an awkward type of gesture that you diving your own head into the ground. That that just is not good. Not a good look for the referee. All right. So this is the first penalty now of the the first two where you could come back from if you did them. And these next eleven, you're out. You're uh, out of the uh, that match, and technically you're out of the tournament. You're out of that weight division. Uh, the first is Kwazugake. And Kawazu means frog leg or you know, frog leg, make it simple. And it's to throw by winding, doing a toe wrap around one leg, around Uke's leg, the ankle. Next. Then kicking the leg forward. This is crucial. This is what makes the, the frog leg and then kicking it forward. Uh, and you'll see and by the examples what that means. And then while facing more or less in the same direction, that's not always the case because I've seen several cases where it's been given and the uke, the Tory is facing the uke when he's doing it, but the leg is being kicked forward. Uh, next. And then generally the throw is being done backwards. And so it's like doing an ochigari, it's like doing an ochigari, kicking the leg forward and uh, falling backward, almost like a yoko gake kind of landing side by side and falling backwards. Okay, next. The use of kawazugake or toe wrap during uchimato, sodagari, and ujigari or any similar techniques is allowed. So if they do a regular osodagari and the tori is facing behind the uke and he wraps the, as he's sweeping, doing the sweeping leg, his toe wraps around the ankle as he's doing the back throw, that's what generally that will be let go during during the impact. That is a score. Same if he does a Uchigari, he does a normal Uchigari where the Tori is facing the um, the Uke and, and the Tori is landing on top of the Uke and set instead of beside him, then he's bringing the foot back, he's hooking the, the leg hooking foot and the toe is wrapped. That's okay. And it, I've also seen when you do Uchimata and they do the wrap and he's going over. That's okay also. Those are all allowed. They, they are not Kawazugake. And next, please. Oh, uh, what, he, what we have to do here, hopefully, is we, we need to change uh, from Ken's machine to my machine because it seems my machine didn't, uh, or uh, the, the copy I sent to Ken, some of the videos didn't work. And we have 15 minutes, Rick. All right. Okay, here we go. Kawazugake is considered dangerous as you fall together with your opponent. It's prohibited in a tournament. All right, that's that. Can everybody, did everybody see that? Ken? Yes. Okay. Um, this is just a, uh, pictures of it. It's, you're catching the leg and winding the toe and then lifting them and turning them backwards. But notice that the white player is kicking the foot forward. And that, that's what makes the illegal act. And then let's see how this comes out. See if my video is. 
Notice how blue wraps and then blue kicks the foot forward, slams them back. Even though it's subtle, it's not as the Kodakon demonstration was very severe, very big. This is subtle, but it is still Kubazugake. So that, that's that's the penalty, and and you should. This is Hansokomake. You kick the foot, kick the foot forward. It's illegal. Okay. I hope everybody sees that. Ken back in. All right, the second Kensetsu was uh, anywhere other than the elbow. Uh, this is the number two Hansukamake. Uh, includes a one hand grip throws, trapping the wrist at the armpit. So these are cases where, you know, if you do a standing arm lock and you don't injure the arm, then it's mate shido. But if you do injure the arm or it's severe, then, then there's a, you can apply this one. Next. And she just fell right on top. That's like a Waki Gatami. And Waki Gatami, interestingly, has its own penalty, which we'll get to quickly. But here you have it, the player, it's almost like a wrist lock. She's okay, right there, very dangerous. All right, next slide, please. That's also, it could be, but well, definitely when blue's been hurt, either the elbow or the wrist, probably the elbow. This could be covered under either this, or if you believe it's a Waki Gatami penalty, then you, you'll cover it under that. Next slide, please. Now these, I don't know, this, I haven't seen this until recently, the last six to eight years, where players are taking a reverse clip on the sleeve and doing these jujitsu kind of arm locks. Um, and that's not what the IGF wants to say. Very dangerous. She, she's putting the arm, she's putting the elbow right there. She's taking the arm and putting her arm against the back of the elbow, putting it into an alarm, arm lock situation. Therefore, that's illegal and Mate and consult in Hansukamake. Next slide, please. Ooh, yep, I think she saw that. It's very, it's like she's trying to snap the, 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 the radius in the ulna on the lower arm. Okay, next, Hansogomake on this. All right, next, number three is to fold directly to the mat while doing Waikigatani. Uh, very similar. And um, some of those cases were actually Waikigatani. Next. Oops, no good. All right, next. Yeah, the IGF, this they just showed this in 2020, said Anzo Gomagi White. Um, push the arrow, Ken. Now notice she spun out of it and 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 hurt the player's arm. So this also is IGF says Hanzo Gomaki. This is at the limit, the idea of that. What that means is it's right on the edge. Uh, it's not very clear. It's not a big 
hunter to my day, but it is very dangerous. Next. Okay, let's watch it. Yeah, he didn't even throw him down, but he he got in there with like a wacky with his belly, of abdomen, and just snapped that arm. He locked it up. And then cranked it. Boom, right against the elbow, standing. And this, this, now you can, you can debate this. Uh, you know, the IGF says Hunter Gomake blue, but you could go to tournament and they might decide if he didn't injure him, they might just give him a Shido for be doing an arm lock in a standing position because it wasn't injured. So that's up to the people who are at that event at that time. Okay, next. All right, number four is reaping the supporting leg from the inside. Uh, the Japanese is that's Kusabi Gari. And here's a very wonderful example of a true Kusabi Gari. He chops the leg right out. Let's see that again. It'll play again. And, uh, and notice Blue grabs his knee as he, as coaches should train him to do. You know, even if he's not injured, he should get up and look like he. Right there, oh, right against the knee. Very dangerous. And most players actually, if they do it, they don't know it's illegal or they have no clue. They just react and think it's okay. But that's very, very dangerous. That's Kusabe Gary. However, next slide, please. Something you don't see that often anymore is, is the thing called Kusabe Dome. It's a, wedge block or foot block and that's okay if the guy comes in and you put your foot across and you don't sweep it you just block it so you don't go flying over uh, his leg that's a good defense because you're not sweeping it however even if you turn your foot that way and you actually drag it back and kind of sweep it uh, some might consider that a sweep but you notice there's nothing against the knee in this case and he's just stopping himself, the, the uke, from being pulled over. Next slide, please. And number five is any action that would endanger or injure the neck or spine. So in, in neishise or groundwork, at the top, on the top, and the uke is in front and double grapevine with the legs of playing a hadaka jime and lifts the body off the mat. Uh, in, in any of these cases, any time, any kind of neck injury uh, should be seriously dealt with. So you don't want anybody to be hurt. And this, most of the cases we see this is where, uh, you know, one player, the uke is on his belt front and the tori is on top of them with a great double grapevine with the legs. And he goes in for Haraka Jime. And then he arches his back up. He actually pulls the guy up, like, like bending him up backwards into a sit-up position. And I think some, many of you have seen something like this, and you just you cringe. This, the body, the back was not designed to go that way. It's, you know, if you turn him around and did it, that's okay. But if you see something like that, that's my day right away. Stop the very dangerous action and penalize it severely. This is bad 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 next fall backwards onto your opponent while clinging to his back um uh, this is usually i don't I haven't seen this lately but if you go in if you go in for let's say ponce Inage, and somehow the guy has locked you up with an overhook which we didn't show you or maybe he did the kusabe dome he blocked the foot and what what we've seen players do is they'll Instead of trying to throw them forward now, they'll try to jump back on them and slam them into the ground. Uh, that is not allowed. This prohibited act 
that covers that Hunsaker-Monkey penalty of falling backwards onto them. It's the same like if you when we could do Kataguruma, uh, you'd go in for Kataguruma, and instead of throwing them off this way, players would like do a suplex with them on your shoulders. That's Hunsaker-Monkey. You're not allowed to do that. Very dangerous. Next, please. Number seven, to lift off the mat and forcefully push him back onto the mat without a judo technique. Uh, you rarely see this, but interestingly, we have it happen. Next slide. Here you have at a top event. This is the, a low grade uh, lift in drive. Boom. She lifted her and then she slammed her back. She didn't go crazy slamming her back, but she did slam her back. So IGF says this is Hansukomake. Mate, consult, and then Hansukomake. Lifting and slamming. It's not allowed. Disregard the referee's instructions. I, I, I've never, I, I've seen them apply this sometimes, but it's very rare to see this because most of the time the players will follow your directions. But if they do disregard your instructions, then you can penalize them. And if it's because it's a Hansukomake, you must consult all three, uh, the two judges, the referees involved and the mat chief. Next penalty, please. All right, to make unnecessary calls, remarks, or gestures to the opponent or the referee of the contest or during the contest. And basically, if you direct, uh, and we, we discuss this when Russ would chair previously to his current uh, um, chairmanship. Uh, he had a couple, he had some national, uh, he held several national uh, judo conferences or conclaves or whatever. And we, and they discovered this. One of the questions I had asked to be covered was whether uh, expletives were, could be, if they're directed, they should be penalized. But if they're undirected, like a player gets thrown and as he gets up, he turns and he slams a mat with his hand and says, oh, and he lets out a four letter word that you can hear because that's undirected that could be considered in the heat of battle and you wouldn't penalize however i know in some areas they have stricter code of conduct and even that is too much and uh they think that should be penalized now that's up to your individual area how, how it's done i don't know how uh, uh what national does as far as currently as if someone were to, to uh, you know, yell out an expletive that was not directed at the referee or the other player. If they are directed at the referee, like you're uh, being polite and you're you're an idiot referee, you don't know what you're doing. No, well, that's not good. Uh, you need to stop that kind of behavior because if they you if that happens and no one picks on it and penalizes that player, then everybody thinks they're going to be able to do it. And, and we can't have that. Okay, next slide, please. Number 10, to wear a hard or metallic object covered or not. And very interesting, I think IGF is very strict on this. In the US though, we have the US rule is that if a player's wearing jewelry or a, some unintended item and he goes out there or she goes out there and the referee notices it after Hajime has been called, you can just call Mate and have them remove the item. Sometimes they'll go out there with a necklace they forgot to take off, or they might have their phone in their gi and they forgot. I had I was at one tournament where where this was when we followed IGF rule, and the player, you know, they used to get the little plastic things with the ribbons hanging down with a little hook in the back that uh, like a, a badge. She forgot, she left that in her gi when she out went out to play. It fell out of her gate. The referee saw the hard pin and Hatsugamake, she's gone. Totally unintentional, totally. And, you know, but the U.S. after that, a couple took a couple of years, but after that, that's, that's silly. Now, at the IGF level, you have a coach going through and making sure you're not doing silly stuff like that. And then the, the control for going out on the mat is supposed to be very strict. So hopefully they catch that. Yet, a couple of years ago, some girl, some woman player went up there and had a change purse or something and went out there. She, they found it. Oh, Hansel Gomake, she's gone. So 
So in the U.S., though, if they have jewelry, if they have uh, something that was left on uh, unintentionally, then you just take it. The referee takes it, puts it in his pocket, let the match continue. You give it back to the player at the end. That's only for the U.S. Now, obviously, if a player has a knee brace, a metal knee brace or something, and, and starts to, you know, that's intent. That's not allowed. And it doesn't have to be metal, by the way. It says hard or metallic. Um, hard, it could be hard plastic. Um, so in, the, in those cases, please be, always consult in these kind of cases the, um, the chief referee of the tournament or the mat, mat uh, chiefs. Next, the last uh, um, prohibited act, Hunter Gomake, uh, is any action against the spirit of judo. And this could be almost anything. But some examples, one is a thing they came up with a few years back called the uh, anti-judo. And uh, that was basically like cowardice. I had a, very hard to call that unless the guy's, uh, you know, like running like a chicken. Oh, I don't want to, you know, running around. I was at one tournament with a national referee was following the rules and two seven-year-olds were playing. And one of the seven-year-olds started crying and didn't want to fight. And he was all ready to give him a Hanzo Kamake. I think, oh, God. You know, that's not what that's for. You know, they, they coach at a, at a junior event in, in, in a state where there's maybe only five to ten clubs there. You know, if you could talk the kid into going in, the coach was trying to calm him down. And get them in. So you don't apply the national rules in a case like that. Be have some common sense. The other thing that we're covered under here is like punching and biting and kicking and spitting, whatever. I know in the case some of you who've been around a while remember we had a U.S. Open. We had two of our top athletes fighting for gold and silver, and one of them decided to bite the other one, and the other one punched her in retaliation. They both were giving Hansokomake. And then so at the medal ceremony, the first and second place were empty on the podium and just the two third place people were on the podium. Um, so no punching and kicking. I know when I ran a state championships a hundred years ago, um, we had a case where two players, two black belts, they, they had this fight going on during the match. You know, it went past just judo. They were you know, like we had to slow it down and tell them calm down. This is a judo contest, not a fight. You know, they're not fighting each other. But it didn't work because at the end, the one player, one of the black belts, threw the other one with a pond, beautiful throw. When he got up, when they went back to their march to dress up, when they were about to bow, the player who had did the throw went like this on his nose, and there was blood on it, and he flicked the blood at the other player from his finger. Hanzo Gomake, even though that he scored the throw, it's Hanzo Gomake. Anyway, so be, be aware of that. Ship like conduct. What happened was, uh, what happened in this case, the white, we can't get the video to play. In any way, uh, basically what happened was the white player got on top of the blue player and in like a, a double uh, grapevine. And for some reason, uh, the, the blue player was face up in this case, like a Tate situation. And the white player decided to start rolling or lifting his body up and slamming blue's head into the ground several times. And that very unsportsmanship like kind of act. Very, very, very. I just, before we go to questions, I just want to thank um, um, Jim Bregman and Rob Riley and Peter Montell as production managers and Jim as the main host for this series to make this possible to bring it to you all. I want to thank Ken for uh, serving as the uh, PowerPoint uh, operator and keeping me on in line and on time. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, someone said about escorting. Generally, the referees are busy refereeing, so they shouldn't be involved with something like that. And I almost, I would tell you, if your if your tournament was well staffed, then there should be kind of some kind, a few people doing security or overall job. They do everything, and those are the people that should assist coaches. So sometimes you have these venues that are so packed, and you try to tell them you have one coach's chair and only one coach should be there. Yet there's three or four people on each side of them sitting, yelling and screaming and coaching, 
uh, the referee may turn around and ask them to go up in the stands. But if they don't, then you have to go to the chief referee or the tournament director to move them. It's not a good idea, in my opinion, for the referee to be a police, uh, do policing action on the map. Because you just get them more riled up. You want a, a neutral party. Uh, sometimes what we do is we use some of the off-duty referees to send them over there to keep, especially if it's a, a unruly crowd, you know, they don't listen to you, just to have someone over there the whole time and, uh, and you know, sc scooting them away, saying, if you're coach, you have a seat right there, good luck, and all the rest of you get behind the fence or sit in the bleachers. You can scream all you want from the bleachers, but uh, and only the coach should be sitting in that chair, no one else sitting by the mat side. All right. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good weekend.